Good morning. Welcome to episode 84 of the Driller Newscast, a weekly update on the news and stories impacting the water well and industrial drilling industry. This is our annual Veterans Day episode celebrating the veterans in our industry and those we should be recruiting. And it is brought to you by TDH Manufacturing. TDH Pump Boys are built to work as hard as you do with the latest technology to deliver the power and precise handling required on today's job sites. TDH will provide superior performance and unmatched versatility day in and day out. This week, we are honoring the veterans that are drillers and pump setters and professionals of our industry and considering how we should be recruiting more for the future. Our feature will be a discussion with United States Marine veteran Robert Meyer and his guidance on hiring veterans and new hires into the drilling industry. This is such a wonderful week for my family. It was my father's birthday on November 9th, November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday, and then Veterans Day on the 11th. So cheers, Marines. On November 10th, it'll be your 247th birthday or the Marines causing all the safety and chaos that we have. And this all started on November 10th, 1775. The Marines were put together to augment naval forces in the Revolutionary War. The recruiting headquarters was set by Captain Samuel Nichols. Yes, it's not a fable in the Ton Tavern on Water Street in Philadelphia, which is now considered the birthplace of the United States Marines. On November 11th, it'll be Veterans Day. Cheers and thank you to all of the United States Army, the Navy engineers, and the United States Red Horse Combat Engineers of the Air Force for drilling water wells with me. Such a reward. And before we jump into safety, I want to leave you with this quote by George Washington. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. Thank you again, soldiers, airmen. We appreciate you. For this week in safety, you know, we talk about Suicide Prevention Month in September. And we move on to other safety statistics and what we need to be focusing on as we wrap up our year. And we've talked about that nearly 50 to 100,000 construction employees take their life. And we can see statistics for veterans and soldiers anywhere from 16 a day to 22 a day. And there's plenty of things that we need to be thinking about, including the 988 hotline that we often talk about on this newscast. This week being Veterans Day, we're going to get into the statistics of post-Gulf War era to veterans and disabilities. But I want us to start with the initiative that started in late 2021 called Don't Wait, Reach Out. This campaign is very important to me. My father's a veteran. November 9th this year, he would have been 75. So this idea of Don't Wait, Reach Out can transcend from just Gulf War era two veterans to our Vietnam vets, the Gulf War initial era to all of the conflicts and situations we've been in in the last 30 years. And this is, the campaign starts with, veterans were trained to put a mission or others before themselves, which can make it harder for veterans to accept or ask for help. I didn't reach out hard enough and push my father during this crazy pandemic. And regardless of where you fall in the guise of what happened or is still happening, 
he needed to be better educated on knowing the symptoms and that a cold is not just a cold. You know, a part of that is being tough. And we see this in the drilling industry often. And so, you know, we have a responsibility regardless of the age of the veteran. The new PSA poses the question, when was the last time you asked yourself for help? Don't wait, reach out. And this is a VA initiative and you can go to visitva.gov backslash reach for the resources. And we need to be thinking about how do we help people? How do we get this out on social media? How do we provide this content and get the words out to the veterans in our lives and everyone we encounter on the street? Because we can all be part of this solution and help save lives. Again, construction workers, individuals listening to this, and especially veterans, being that we're honoring you this week, it's okay to ask for help. If you're a veteran in crisis or concerned about one, contact the Veteran Crisis Line. It's 24 seven, it's confidential support. You don't have to be enrolled in the VA or healthcare to connect. You can dial to reach responders, 988, then press one. We can also chat online at veteranscrisisline.net or text 838255. You can text 838255 and reach out for help. It's okay. Tragically, our nation's veterans are at the highest risk for suicide compared to the general population. And the only way we're going to slow that down and fix it is for us all to be involved and be thinking about this. Every one of us plays a role in suicide prevention. I know reaching out isn't always the easiest. We don't, just a rough and tough industry I can't just say, are you doing okay? But you know what? We work with individuals every day and we can see when things are off and we got to do a better job. The great thing about the veterans in our industry is they're trained to do hard things and sacrifice. And that's something that we exploit. We can't do it on this level. So again, don't wait, reach out. If you were a veteran, you know, need support. Follow all of the help that's out there from 988 to the va.gov backslash reach. Let's start the conversation. Industry, we can do a better job at this. We can support those that need to. For this week's feature, we're going to sit down with Robert Meyer. United States Marine Corps veteran, driller in the industry, great knowledge share, and one of my personal friends that I spend a lot of time talking about this industry with. And uh, he has always been one of the first to jump on and have a discussion. And we go to these conferences and shows and we get on these workforce development calls. And the first thing we say is that generation graduating high school just doesn't want to work. They're just not the same. And then we go, I know what we'll do. Let's just hire more veterans into the industry. And it's an interesting piece to be at because yes, we need to hire more veterans into the industry. And yes, we need to figure out how to work with all the individuals that want to work in our industry right now. Robert's going to share that. But we've talked statistics a lot, and we know that there's nearly 162 million Americans working every day in the United States. There's 19 million veterans currently working in the United States. And I think that's a very big piece because how many are working in construction? 1,330,000, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And that's helmets to hard hats and 
all the processes we have with SkillBridge. And we've talked about this and you can go back and look at several other discussions and podcasts on that. So 15% of our construction industry right now are our nation's heroes placed back into our industry. We consider 9-11 a pivotal point in our construction history because from 2001 to 2010, with the economic downturn, we had a lot of great individuals go off and deter terror as it was deemed fit. And if we look at post-Gulf War era two veterans, 65% of them have some sort of lifelong impact from deployment. Now, it's very easy for us as an industry to go, oh, they just want to get their disability. No, we change the way we went into war. And with large anti-mine vehicles, anti-IED vehicles, protected the body parts, but that concussion was still there. We see how bad that is. So we can also see from burn pits and hearing loss, plenty of things there beyond just combat related that uh, just like the construction industry, we we treat our, our bodies poorly and uh, it shows. 47% of veterans deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, which is considered the post 9-11 group, are likely suffering from PTSD or major depression and is not seeking support. We just covered this in safety, but again, 988 crisis line for emergency counseling, it's a very important tool. And so if we're going to hire veterans to be part of our company, and we're gonna have standard operating procedures, and we're gonna have job safety analysis, and we're gonna take care of our people as we see it necessary, that has to be a piece of it. I quoted George Washington as we opened this episode. Again, here's another one that I think fits right into the discussion we're about to have with Robert. And I, I stare at this quote a lot because it, it makes me think of the drilling industry. It makes me think of working with Master Chief Nate Laidlaw, Chief Robin, Captain Jake Fletcher, uh, Tech Sergeant Kevin Lebrano, to Taka and Fish and Caceres, um, the 820 Red Horse and the 819 and the 823rd and the Triple Nickel and you know, the Philippines, Guam. It's um, It's been really cool, the men and women that are actually drilling right now around the world with no professional family drilling experience, but military discipline and the ability to do it. And hats off to them. And um, the 802... Army, National Guard, Waterwell units running V2000s to the Red Horse, combat engineers running 50Ks to the uh, Seabees, who uh, one of the last things Dick Schramm did was pass on some uh, Schramm rigs, you know, after the Chilean miner. So they're out there running our equipment and they're doing good around the world and they're advocating and we, we need to be hiring them. But this is why I want to get to this point. To expect the same service from raw and undisciplined recruits as from veteran soldiers is to expect what never did and perhaps never will happen. Men who are familiarized to danger meet it without shrinking, whereas troops unused to service often apprehend danger where no danger is. That is our industry. And as much as we say we want these hard workers, and Robert's going to allude to this, what do we do? The moment we get them signed up and we get that hard hat and PPE 
on them and we get in the field, we go, you know nothing. They know plenty. They know how to execute. We need to lead. We need to have the proper standing, standard operating procedures to do this. Let's jump into this discussion with Robert Meyer. I want to introduce you to Robert Meyer, retired United States Marine, driller, awesome industry advocate and knowledge share. Robert, we're going to jump right into this. Our industry needs a better elevator pitch, sales pitch to the veterans of the industry. How do we get them involved? You know, one of the issues is that we don't have a great sales pitch for non-veterans either. I mean, the, the reality is that one of the things that I wrote about in the recent article that was published in the Waterwell Journal was trust. And you now we, I interviewed candidates coming from other segments of construction and even people that, that work for me say, well, they don't have any experience. I'm like, well, they don't have any experience as a driller. They don't have any experience shoveling cuttings, but that doesn't mean they don't know how to use a shovel. That doesn't mean they don't know how to use a skid steer. That means they don't know. That doesn't mean they don't know that, you know, uh, what a backup alarm is or how to do a pre-trip inspection or how to do a pre-operability check on something. Just because they don't have experience in our industry doesn't mean they don't have experience in the greater industry. And so what that does is it creates this like very uh, adversarial hiring environment where it's like you, only, you can only get paid well if you come to us with five years drilling experience. It's like, well, what is drilling experience? Are you really, are you willing to pay for helper experience? Because in my experience, a good helper makes a great driller. But there are so many times where it's like, oh, but they were only a helper at that company. I'm like, so what's wrong with that company? What's wrong with, with those holes that they drill? And, and I think that to me, that speaks to a larger protectionist or, or some, something along those lines environment that makes it really difficult for people to enter. And it makes it, di it makes it difficult for them to enter because they can't accept the entry level wage that would be fine for 18, 19 year old coming out of high school, coming into the industry. But is it fine for somebody with four or five or six or seven years of experience and started on professional credentialing and whatever? Yeah, maybe it's not a drilling license, but that doesn't mean that they don't have skills. And so I think that, that we can't really get to the veterans thing until we really have an honest discussion with ourselves about what's our pitch to the greater world. Once we get that fixed, then we can really target veterans better. You know, you hit on a really great point with family sustaining wage. When we think about this next generation coming in, these high schoolers, and we say they don't have the experience, they don't want to work. And then we bring in these veterans who have deployed, who have had really big stakes in other careers. And then we get them in and we're like, this is who we need because they know how to work. Yet we go, wait, what do you know about standing on a platform and pulling levers? Yeah, sure. You worked in some high stakes and you had your friends back, but... You don't know anything about drilling. Yeah, of course, you know, that that comment right there, if taken improperly, can be, you know, belittling or viewed as belittling of those that have experience. And it's not. It's just, you know, there, there's value to, to the experiences that everybody brings. And I think it's hard, especially when I think about geothermal, geotechnical, and environmental, where you can get into these project environments where margins are slim. And I don't, I don't have time to spend four months training somebody in an unbillable capacity uh, because competition gets pretty tight on some of these, some of these jobs. But you know, it becomes a chicken and the egg discussion, and, and it's like, okay, well, I just looked at a report that was going over our turn turnover for the last three years and the cost of that turnover, and I was just thinking, like, what if we had given a dollar or two raise? to all of those people and cut 
the turnover in half and what the cost overall net cost savings would have been because it wouldn't have been a net, net expense it would have been a net savings uh, and it's just so interesting because people don't aren't it generally don't think in those terms because it's like well but if we give joe that and we have to go over here and give susie and jeff and and rob these things that's like well but is that better overall because if you don't give that to joe or those three gonna leave anyway <laughs> because now they don't have enough help and they're overpaid it's like it, it's it's a it's a very uh stark conundrum where i hear you know these kids don't want to work anymore i'm like yeah they do they just want to go work for Amazon making 70 grand a year starting out 40 hours a week. And yeah, maybe they bust their apps for that 40 hours, but you know what? 70 grand a year is better than they're going to go make working as a, as a driller's helper. Family sustaining wage. You know, if we look at what the Bureau of Labor Statistics is doing right now, and we look at uh, extreme weather and climate change, this whole idea of you can work all the hours you want because we're not going to pay you much, you know, 40 plus 10, 40 plus 20. Then we look at these massive distribution centers and I'm not going to make fun of them because I really like getting my packages on the next day. So we'll just leave it as a prime deal for an employee. But man, if I have an option between extreme heat, like you've seen in Texas this year, rain, cold weather, floods i can do 40 plus whatever at 22 bucks an hour or i can have that great wage with 401k insurance in a climate controlled building i'm going to choose that and it's something our industry is going to have to start thinking about yeah it's it's a risk thing. you know every company makes risk assessments and makes risk and and and, and takes actions to mitigate risk every day. Well, employees do too. <laughs> but employers don't see it that way. They see it as, oh, we, you know, put so so much time and energy and effort into so and so. And then, well, when work slows down and, and the deal that you have with them is is that they need to get overtime in order to make the, the hourly or the annual salary that they need to sustain their family. And then you prevent their ability to do that as an organization and then they lose trust and then they say okay i'm out i'm going to go find somebody else and so it's it, it really gets to the core of our hiring problem which you know as much as i want to hire veterans i mean there's a lot of problems that we get to in the industry before we even get there as an industry problems we just think we've decided this new generation or the previous generation can't work so solve our problem is our veterans. And ironically, we look at 65% of Gulf War era two veterans have some sort of disability. That's not something that's taken lightly or they're just trying to get paid. It's just it. They need to be able to have counseling, go to the VA. However, as an industry, we just think, you know what? They have military discipline and their new mission is our job, and that's all that matters. Is that a good assessment? No, I think it is. And and um, you know, there are some people that like that like the travel and they like the, the long hours and, and things like that. But you know, one of the other things that I wrote about was how companies have a certain degree of expectation that, that a veteran's gonna come in and be kind of a robot, you know, and at the end of the day, they're people and they want to experience life and they want to do things and meet people and do all of those things that humans do. Um, and the reality is that some of our organizations just make that really difficult. You know, you work sun up to sundown and, and Monday to Friday and sometimes Monday to Sunday and um, it's just tough. And, you know, we, <clears throat> there, are, there are companies that, you know, if you say, no, I can't travel this week, they say, okay, find another job. You know, that's not, <laughs> that's completely unreasonable. Um, and I don't know how to fix it. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, my company is not perfect. We have our own financial challenges and hurdles to be able to, to get somewhat 
close to a semblance of a work-life balance. And I know that in certain segments of what we do, we do not strike that. Doesn't mean we're not trying, but you know, one of, one of the other things that comes to mind is we also have to be competitive. And that means competing with companies who don't care about those things. And so you have to play the game a little bit to, you know, there are companies that will literally bid a project to work nonstop until it is done. I don't know where they're finding these people. I'd love to hire the people. <laughs> so there's another way to do business. Um, but you know, it's, it's an industry issue, not, not a Rob and Brock issue to be resolved. And, and we just need to go about it a little bit better. Otherwise we're never going to get out of this hole. Where nobody wants to work. No, nobody wants to work in the conditions that you want them to work in. And you can't afford the conditions that they want to work in unless you elevate your price, which you're afraid to do. In reality, it's nobody wants to work for that company. And I think it comes right back down to that mission. We've decided that our project is the mission. In reality, it's it's a balance. It's do we work to live or live to work? And obviously after COVID, crazy pandemic, it's about everything else that happens. And we have all of the special moments of after a deployment, developing a family, you know, finding that significant other to Wednesday night softball and being on that diamond and hitting that home run and high-fiving all your camaraderies and thinking about how much fun reliving high school or college is, you know, we have to find the purpose for them and we balance it with their purpose. So if we believe in what they need, they'll believe in what we need. Yeah. What do you think? So how do we fix it? Robots, automation, making things smarter, easier for us to work. No more cavemen, just smart men. <laughs> I mean, that's a component though, right? One of, one of the things that, that came up in one of the meetings I was in last week was automation. And how does automation relate to drilling? And you and I have talked about it, um, you know, that using, starting to use some monitoring while drilling type stuff so that we can make a more adaptable machine uh, to more heavily automate some of these tasks. Yeah, blast hole drilling, they've already got automated rigs, but you know, you're drilling through the same stuff over and over and over again. Whereas geotech and environmental and geothermal, you know, geothermal to a certain extent, but, but environmental and geotech, every hole is wildly different. Every site is wildly different. And so that means it's more and more complicated. Uh, but then, you know, I even hesitate to bring this up now because is somebody gonna, gonna say, Rob's trying to take away my job? No, no. But can we make everybody's job just a little bit easier? Yeah, I think so, probably. We make it easier by trusting our people and utilizing those innovations, right? Like, think about it. There's a ton of things on a project that we could be doing with our minds and our hands that is writing from logs to science to every aspect of the project that we don't have time to do because we're so labor intensive. And that's something we have to think about that our people have to trust us that just because we make it easier to do that there isn't more intellectually to do. And I think that's a big piece because we see a lot of companies right now going, if I could just get to one driller, it would be a safer job site. It's a horrible concept. I agree. Thank you for your time today. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate it. Go Marine Corps, Semper Fi. Thanks again for all the knowledge you've shared today, Robert. Thanks for the opportunity as always. Thank you for joining us for episode 84 of the Driller Newscast. A huge thank you to TDH Manufacturing, who has supported the news coming right to you every Monday morning for 80 plus weeks now with no influence on what the content is, but supporting the fact that we're getting breaking news out there. And from Scott to Cade to Briner to the entire TDH team, thank you. 
go check out their manufacturing facility video. It is awesome. All of the innovation and game-changing ways they're influencing this industry to become better. And their equipment is versatile and smart and uh, everything we want out of innovation. It's awesome to see it. Veterans, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you in the construction industry, in the drilling industry. You can check out the driller.com and see monthly columns from retired Captain Jacob Fletcher of the United States Red Horse, Waterwell Drillers. Robert Meyer, got some stuff coming in from you. It's great, your insight and all the podcasts you've been able to jump on in the past. So many great stories out there to be told. And uh, just, I appreciate all that you do. Industry, it's wild to think that they're out there training and executing without a legacy family behind them, but great manufacturers and industry volunteers and experts all coming together to see water wells completed for the Syrian refugees or water wells completed for fobs in Afghanistan when we were there in Iraq, you know, uh, what the 555 is doing down in Guam, looking elsewhere, South Korea. It is cool. And uh, from challenge coins to my favorite red hats that have been honored to accept over the years, we value everything you're doing. And uh, we need to be telling more of a generation that you can go and be part of a global community and uh, be helping people and learning a skilled trade like drilling. And then drilling companies, we got to get back and we got to hire these great individuals into our industry. Cheers. Hey, Marines, I know that your birthday has fallen on a Friday and Veterans Day, obviously, which is always the next day. It's kind of ironic that Veterans Day is a national holiday uh, after you uh, celebrate your birthday, just be smart, be responsible, and Semper Fi. Happy birthday, Dad. You would have been 75. He was a hell of a Marine, Navy Cross recipient in Vietnam. And I appreciate from World War One to Two to Korea to Vietnam to today, all of the great men and women who have come home and joined the water in the drilling industry and the oil and gas industry and help put holes in the ground and advance our civilization. Cheers, veterans. <laughs>